Hello, everyone. We are going to give everyone uh, a few minutes to filter in here. I expect that we'll start at one or two after. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for everyone's patience. I know I'm a chronically late person, so I'm going to give uh, that grace to all of our other attendees. We're gonna give everyone about 30 more seconds and then get started here. Okay, uh, I believe that we are ready to go and we are going to be cognizant of our time and try to get everyone out right at two, if not a little bit before. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar and the release of the new report, Got Five on it, Economic Impacts and Observations of the Abandoned Mine Land Economic Revitalization Program, Five Years In. Today's conversation is being hosted by the Reclaiming Appalachia Coalition, a multi-state work group composed of Appalachian Voices working in, West, working in Virginia, Coalfield Development Corporation working in West Virginia, and Rural Action working in Ohio, with technical assistance and added capacity provided by Downstream Strategies. We are thankful to our core funders, including the Just Transition Fund and the New York Community Trust. My name is Marissa Lotzenheiser, and I work as a program director with Rural Action in Eastern Ohio. I would encourage anyone interested in abandoned mine land reclamation and in considering how abandoned mine land reclamation can play a role in a just transition for our Appalachian economy to check out our website at reclaimingappalachia.org. We have re least annual reports as well as special features like today's report, looking at the tools and the programs that can help assist our region and our coal impacted communities. I'm happy to introduce Evan Hansen, Dale Shannon, and Joey James with Downstream Strategies, who will be discussing today's report. Adam Wells with Appalachian Voices will be monitoring the chat as well as moderating the Q&A session at the end. They've done the heavy lifting of combing through numerous interviews, data sets, and figures compiled by state agencies and community partners as they relate to AMWARE projects. The insights provided by looking at trends in these reports will be invaluable to both the agencies tasked with implementing these programs, as well as the communities they are most likely to impact. Please know that we are holding time for questions with our presenters at the conclusion of the report release. Please type any questions that you may have either into the Q&A box or into the chat function. Without further introduction, Evan, I believe you're going to start us off. Thank you, Marissa, for the introduction. My name is Evan Hansen. I'm one of the principals at Downstream Strategies. And uh, we're gonna be looking at some data and conclusions related to the abandoned mine land economic revitalization program or AMLR is what we're gonna call it today. Uh, this is a program that's been in existence for several years now. Uh, the 
The goal of the program is to return abandoned mine lands and adjacent areas to productive use through community and economic development. So this has been an important program in terms of directing resources into coal communities that have been suffering from the decline of coal production. And it's separate and distinct from the traditional abandoned mine lands program that focuses on mine land reclamation. Downstream Strategies is an environmental and economic development consulting firm. We're based in West Virginia, and uh, three of us from Downstream Strategies will be presenting today. Um, with me today is Dale Shannon, who's a senior economist at Downstream, and Joe James, one of the other principals, and you'll hear from them in a few minutes. The Ambler program began in 2016 and through the course of the last five plus years has allocated $655 million to six states and three tribes. And um, we in this report are most interested in four of the states. So a lot of the numbers that we'll be presenting will be for Kentucky, Ohio, Virginia, and West Virginia. Of the $655 million allocated under the Ambler program, $410 million has been allocated to those four states. And to do our analysis, we compiled a database that includes 208 projects, 208 Ambler funded projects across six states and one tribe had a total of $431 million in grant commitments for those 208 projects. The database was compiled with information from the Office of Surface Mining, state agencies. We had discussions with some Ambler project managers and also some additional internet research. And in the database, we've compiled project names and locations, the allocations to each of these projects and the expenditures so far, as well as dates for key milestones. So these have fed into two linked analyses in our report. Uh, the first has to do with those dates for the key milestones, trying to understand how long it's taking for projects to uh, come to completion and why it takes so long. And then the second analysis is our, uh, our review of the local economic benefits that are accruing to the communities in which these projects are based. And we make a distinction between three types of money, three types of funds. Um, the first type is what's actually allocated to the states. So that's the $410 million that I mentioned that's been allocated to the four states of interest that you see on this chart. But of the money that's allocated by the federal government, uh, not all that money has been committed to projects yet. That's the middle bar in this chart for each of the four states. But then once funds are committed to a project, it takes a considerable amount of time for that money to be spent. That's the right most bar for each state. That's not necessarily a problem. It, it will take time to get through the process. There's a lot of planning work that needs to be done. It takes time to build and implement these projects. Uh, however, as you'll see in our conclusions and analysis, you know, there is a sense of urgency in making sure these funds are committed and spent as, as rapidly as reasonably possible in order to maximize the benefits to the communities that need the benefits most. One way to look at the amount of funds that have been the unrealized benefits of this program is this chart, which summarizes some of the detailed economic work that, that Dale took the lead on. The left-hand bar is the amount of funds that's been allocated to those four states. So the, the dark green is the 410 million that I mentioned before. But the benefits to the local communities come not just from the 410 million that's gonna be spent but all the indirect and induced benefits, a lot of other benefits, secondary effects, we're calling them, that occur to the local community. 
And you can see that the, the total size of that left-hand bar is considerably more than 410 million. It's up in the 700 to 800 million dollar range. That would be the local economic benefit of, if all the allocated funds were spent, but just a small portion has been spent so far. And that's what the middle bar shows. And the difference between what's been allocated, the 410 million, and what's been spent, which has been about 109 million, according to our database. That difference on the right hand bar is the unrealized benefits that are going to come in the future. In that database of 208 projects, we, we looked at it in different ways. And one way to look at it is to understand the size of the AMLA grants that have been provided by state. Uh, these are uh, frequency distribution charts. They show the count um, for different project sizes. So for example, the, the left-hand bar, the top left-hand bar is for Kentucky. And it shows that Kentucky has provided 20 AMLA grants that have been less than a million dollars. So each of those bars shows a count. Uh, and as you go across, they're in million dollar increments. And one thing that's notable about this chart is that there are some outliers in West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, there have been three projects that have been greater than $12 million. Two of those three projects have been in West Virginia, the third in Kentucky. Um, and with the exception of those three projects, the, the size of the annual grants have you know, generally been less than around $4 million each. The other thing we did to characterize the projects is to divide them into project types. And this required some judgment calls on our part to put each project into a single category. But the three categories that had the largest grant commitments or the largest total grant commitments were manufacturing facilities, reclamation and land development, and water and sewer systems. Those all had over 100 million dollars of, of commitments to this project. And when we're looking at the AMLER process, there's a role to play by the state agencies that are implementing the program and the Federal Office of Surface Mining. Each state is given some leeway in terms of the details of how they run the program. But in general, there is some type of an application process in each of the states. And that phase ends when the state agency submits the application to the Office of Surface Mining for a vetting process. Then the second phase is that vetting process at OSM where they review what's been submitted. And if they think it's consistent with the, the rules and the spirit of the, of the AMBLER program, they'll issue a preliminary approval. And it's at that stage that the planning process begins and money can begin to be spent. And the planning process is notable uh, because that's what we found has taken the longest amount of time in general. Uh, the planning process includes, among other things, compliance work with NEPA, to, with the National Environmental Policy Act. And sometimes the NEPA process and other planning processes take a lot of time. But once the planning work is done, the Office of Service Mining would issue an authorization to proceed and it would flow into the implementation phase where construction would occur. In our report, we look at some of the reasons why the planning phase has taken so much time compared to the other phases of the process. And one thing we looked at is whether the, the size of the grant award um, has an impact on the number of days spent in the planning phase. This table divides those 208 projects into those 10 largest projects that are $5 million or larger and then the rest of them are smaller than 5 million. And if you look on the right-hand side, the days in the planning phase, the median number of days, you can see that uh, there's a pretty significant difference between the amount of time it takes, the median amount of time it takes to get through the planning phase for the large projects versus the small ones. In fact, it takes almost twice as much time to get through that process. We also looked at the difference in the amount of 
phase in the planning phase by state. This is a box and whiskers chart. And for each state, it kind of helps you visualize the, the variability in the number of days in the planning phase. And they're ordered from top to bottom by states that take longer to states that take a shorter amount of time. And what I wanted to focus your attention on is the white dots, which are the average number of days, and then the vertical lines that are sometimes close to the white dots, sometimes a little bit separate from the white dots. That's the median number of days. So Kentucky, the Kentucky takes the largest number of the largest amount of time in the planning phase compared to all the states that we looked at. Uh, but what's most notable here is the state of Ohio. And especially if you look at the, the vertical bar for Ohio, which is the median number of days. If you, what, what that means is that typically the Ohio projects are moving through the planning phase quicker. And the reason for that, we believe, is because the Ohio agency that runs the AMR program plays a very active role in the planning process, conducts the NEPA review themselves rather than putting that on the back of the subrecipients, uh, some of whom may have experience with planning and NEPA processes and some who may not. So that's something that's uh, unique about Ohio and seems to uh, be helping them get through this process more quickly than other states. We also looked at the number of days in the planning phase by those five project types that I mentioned a few slides ago. And probably the most notable thing on this slide is the reclamation and land development type, which is down here. And the median number of days in the reclamation and land development project type is, is clearly lower than the others. Um, one reason the median is, is an interesting uh, number to look at is uh, it's not impacted by these outliers, these dots all the way on the right-hand side here. And so there, those reclamation and land development projects are, among all these types of projects, they're the ones that are most closely similar to the traditional abandoned mine program projects um, with reclamation work that's done on the abandoned mine lines. Hey, Evan. So real quick, uh, there was a question from one of the audience members. Uh, about what, what the blue boxes indicate? Well, the, the blue boxes, I believe, go from the 25th to the 75th percentile of data. Is that right, Dale? Yeah, it's just the interquartiles. Um, from, if you order all observations, largest to smallest, um, the middle 50% middle of them are sitting inside those. So basically, those, those states or those project types with, with wider blue boxes have a lot more variability in the data than the ones with the, with the smaller blue boxes. So I'm going to turn it over to Dale for a few slides to talk about the economic benefits. So thank you, Evan. And um, I will start by talking a little bit about the left side of this graphic. Um, it's a economic impact concept. Um, and so to understand the full contribution to the economies from these dollars being spent, uh, we ran economic scenarios for the four states that we're focusing on Kentucky, Ohio, Virginia, and West Virginia um, through the implant model. Um, and, and to be clear, while well, the common quip that economists like to say is all models are wrong and some are useful, um, this is very useful because what it allows us to do is to look at not just the direct costs of running the program, but the secondary effects associated with that um, and the secondaries would be the indirect and induced effects. So um, for a given economic 
change. In this case, we're using an industry change, if you're familiar with the M-Plan model. Uh, we, we specify a, a scenario with specific dollars so that either the allocated um, or the spent, or in the third case, the case studies, which is the graphic on the right. Um, we specify the dollars associated with that activity. The model looks at for a given geography, in this case, the four, each, any one of the four states that has that activity occurring and says, well, to make that happen, what type of industry activity within the state would be required to support that. That secondary effect is the indirect effect and that is associated with um, both commodities being used for production and services. So uh, engineers would be in there along with providing rock gravel sand as well as shipping the gravel or sand as well as building the buildings um, would be included in those. For both of those, the induced effect is the dollars that are earned by the employees at those facilities that, that, that are providing the direct and indirect activity. Those, that, that labor income gets spent inside, a share of that labor income, the model understands the region well enough to know that the share of that income for the residents inside the region would get spent in other activity, economic activity, and that's included. So overall, we have the direct, indirect, and induced effects all totaling a full impact across the region. And we ran that for the money, the funds that were allocated. Um, if you go back and think about the earlier graphic, uh, that Evan showed with the three bars, the two bars on the left and the negative bar on the right. The allocated dollars are the potential of what could have been spent. The spent dollars are what's actually been spent to the, by the end of 2021 on dollars. And then we also ran the models for a set of six case studies that Joy will be talking about in a minute. So, um, each of the models uh, have a unique up to 544 industries uh, that would have possibilities of multipliers. And the multipliers basically suggest that for a given level of a direct effect, for a given level of, in this case, funding activity, what would the total impact from that activity be in dollars? There's also a set, set of multipliers for employment and for labor income, as well as the other components that are in uh, the concept of value added. Um, what we are looking at here is a graphic that shows the multipliers for the five industry sectors we are working with. And in each case, it shows Ohio at the top, which is entirely consistent with the idea that Ohio is the largest economy. Therefore, it has the most potential to self-feed the, the industries, um, secondary industries necessary, and probably also reflects the fact that there's a higher labor uh, income uh, rate uh, employment wage rate going to to the, those uh, especially those industries. So these multipliers are by the industry sector, um, by state, and um, West Virginia shows up on the lowest side. That's a much smaller economy, so that's natural. However, also you'll notice that the uh, industries, the level of the multiplier changes depending on what type of industry it is and the local share that's necessary. Next slide. For our analysis, we need to be clear that we are focusing on just the implementation of the AMLER funds. We are not looking at the secondary, what, wow, well, that's a very bad word for an economists use on an impact analysis for the ongoing effects associated with these 
what these activities result in. These activities result in a return to productive potential for productive use of the land. That return to productive use will then create another set, a whole another world of economic activity. And, and that can be from businesses being sited on the now usable land, or in many cases, increase of tourism from uh, rail trails or uh, water trails, or even fishing. Uh, one of our one of the case studies we used talk, has a, a return to productive use for trout fishing in West Virginia. So all of that would create a set of secondary impacts. We're not looking at those. So I'm going to hand it over to Joy at this point. I think it's actually Evan. Yeah, I'll go through a couple more slides. Oh, um, so Dow, Dow introduced the, the in-plan model and the types of economic benefits that, that we looked at in this, in this project. And just to put some numbers on it, uh, the, the first thing that we looked at were the impacts from the allocation from the $410 million sent to the four states. And that's in this output column, that $410 million due to the multipliers that Dale mentioned would actually have an impact of about $715 million should all of those funds be spent. But we're not there yet because most of that money's not been spent yet. Where we are right now, according to our best information, is an expenditure of $109 million and local economic benefit of 187 million. So there's a, a lot more money to be spent over the coming years, and that's gonna generate a significant amount of local economic benefits. Not even counting those ongoing benefits that Dale mentioned in this final slide. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Joey. Yeah, thanks, thanks Evan. Yeah, so using industry standard models like in-plan is a, is a great way to estimate what the economic impact of Ambler projects has been to date. However, it's also really important to verify uh, you know, assumptions by digging into what is actually happening on the ground to make sure that your models are, are appropriate, right? So to do this and to develop a better understanding of common challenges and concerns associated with the program, our report features six project case studies that the project team dug into at a, a deep, deeper level. Um, these six case studies are, are mapped here. There's three in West Virginia and three in Ohio that we looked at. And I, I want to talk just about uh, a couple of those here. Uh, Evan, if you can move to the next slide. Yeah, so the, the first one is for Buzz Foods Appalachian Avatar Project in Kanawha County, West Virginia. So Buzz received $5.9 million in an Ambler grant uh, in 2018 to develop a piece of critical agricultural infrastructure that allows West Virginia beef to stay in the state rather than being shipped away uh, to, to be processed. And, and they're doing this um, adjacent to um, some, some abandoned mine land features. And so the project qualified for an Ambler grant. So as illustrated in the table here, the economic impact on West Virginia's economy from the implementation activities associated with that $5.9 million Ambler grant um, was approximately 9.5 million in total sales across the, the state of, of West Virginia. And so this increase in economic activity is estimated to generate 68 jobs and uh, $5 million in value added wealth uh, in the state. So included in that $5 million of, of value added wealth is 4.1 million in, in labor income. So just during construction, um, that project provided $4.1 million in income to, to West Virginia workers. So uh, you know, having a, a, a great impact on the, the state's economy. So the total economic impact of this project includes, Evan, if you could go back to the previous slide. The total economic impact of this project includes the direct activity provided by the managers at the Appalachian Abattoir, as well as indirect effects that are associated with the increase in production 
by companies uh, across the state to prepare the site and, and actually build um, that facility. So this increase in production um, includes all industry sectors that supported the, the construction, including architects and engineers, lawyers, fabricators, um, you know, transportation and delivery industries, tool and equipment manufacturing, rental and repairs. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Now, Evan. So uh, Buzz only recently held a ribbon cutting event. So we don't know precisely what the ongoing impacts of the facility will be, but the Appalachian Abattoir plans to apprentice 10 to 25 workers per year to support its labor requirements and encourage the development of a more highly skilled meat labor market uh, in the region, which until recently has imported uh, you know, product and, and workers from, from outside, workers that have been trained outside the area. So the Appalachian Abattoir will also provide training and support to West Virginia's livestock producers to improve their capacity, as well as the, the product quality and value that our livestock producers are uh, um, producing here in, in, in West Virginia. So go to the next slide, please. So the next case study that I want to talk about is an Ambler project that was completed by the Guernsey County, uh, was completed in Guernsey County, Ohio at the D.O. Hall Business Park. So this project is kind of your, your typical Ambler project, I would say. So the, the Cambridge Guernsey County Community Improvement Corporation worked with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to address a mine subsidence issue that was, the subsidence issue was really inhibiting the growth of a budding uh, business park. So work was completed through a $1.4 million Ambler grant to address the subsidence issue. Um, the project actually ended up costing um, a little less than $1.4 million. Um, but in any case, the, the subsidence issue was, was addressed. Evan, if you could go to the next slide, please. So the immediate economic impact associated with the money spent on that project was approximately $2.9 million in increased sales across the state of Ohio. And, uh, and those sales are associated with 14 jobs. So the total increase in wealth as measured by value added was 1.4 million uh, with about $860,000 of, um, of income going to workers uh, during, during the, the remediation period. So this impact was, was driven by the direct effect of uh, that $1.4 million of an Ambler grant. And that direct effect generated an estimated 6.2 jobs and about $420,000 of, of labor income. So go ahead and go to the uh, next slide, please. So again, given that the project was only recently completed, we don't really have a good handle on what the precise long-term impact of the Ambler Grant will be. However, today the DO Hall Business Park hosts more than 500 permanent jobs and the Ambler Grant has allowed for continued support of those jobs and continued growth of the park. So, you know, here are just uh, a couple of recent headlines from the local newspaper about new opportunities coming to the, the D.O. Hall Business Park. And these opportunities would, uh, would likely not be, not be coming to the park if they still had a, a serious mine subsidence issue. Um, you can only imagine that, uh, you know, it wouldn't these things will not happen. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back to Evan, who's gonna talk about some of the conclusions. Thanks, Joey. Um, well, as we've mentioned already, some of our conclusions are just about how, how it has been realized so far and what's yet to come. The, the, most of Ambler's local economic benefits have not yet been realized. That's, that's for two reasons. One is that a lot of the funds are still in process and they haven't been spent yet. And the other reason is that even after they're spent, a lot of these projects are going to still take some period of time to start to realize those ongoing economic benefits. Uh, so while we've been able to, to document some of the benefits so far, most of the benefits are in the future. Uh, 
Uh, with that being said, there's an urgency to spend these funds as quickly as possible because there's a great need for uh, the local jobs and the local spending in economies that have been um, hit by the decline of coal production. That's one thing that's particularly good about the Amler program because it re requires the nexus with, with abandoned mine lands um, that these funds are being directed into coal communities. Um, the, the other thing that gives us a sense of urgency is inflation. So a million dollar Amler grant a few years ago would, would purchase more if it was spent then than if it's spent in the future. And especially with the inflation rates we're seeing now, there's a particular urgency to get these projects on the ground. But of course, this is balanced by the need to ensure that taxpayer dollars are spent wisely. We're not advocating that we um, circumvent the NEPA process, for example, even though that, that takes such a long time. But there may be ways uh, to anticipate some things in the NEPA process and help subrecipients get through that process more efficiently. In terms of recommendations, uh, our first recommendation is to put additional effort into the application phase uh, to really make sure that these projects are well thought out from the start, because that would help minimize unexpected delays during that planning phase, which is the phase that's taken such a long time. Some types of delays that we heard about, like COVID, for example, you know, nobody could really do anything about, but there are other types of delays that could potentially be anticipated. The second recommendation is to consider having state agency staff play a more active role in the planning phase. This gets back to how Ohio stood out with their active role in the planning phase and how they were then able to move their projects through the planning phase more quickly than other states. Uh, you know, this gets into questions about staffing up state agencies and you know, what we learned is that many state agencies were hesitant to staff up their AMLA program because it was a pilot program for so many years and they didn't know if it was going to be around a year or two in the future. Um, but hopefully if the AMLA program is made permanent, that'll help give some certainty and allow uh, state agencies to staff up and, and play a more active role in that planning phase. Um, specifically related to NEPA, some, sometimes the, uh, the subrecipients would have to wait for a certain season in order to do the required NEPA work, um, just do the type of threatened or endangered species that were potentially found at the site. And to the extent that experts in the NEPA process at a state agency could anticipate that and perhaps work with a subrecipient to uh, to do things quick, more quickly so as not to have to wait for several seasons, that would, that would really be helpful. And th the fourth recommendation here is to consider providing smaller grants. Uh, smaller grants seem to be implemented more quickly in general. And the added benefit of providing smaller grants is that there are so many communities that are in need of this type of economic development investment that that would help spread the wealth to even more cold communities. We also think it's really important to have as transparent a project selection process as possible, not just because that's good government, but uh, because we think that that would uh, lead to better projects being selected and uh, a more efficient uh, pathway through the vetting process by the Office of Surface Mining, for example, and would potentially also help lead to projects that have fewer unexpected delays in the future. Um, as we move forward, and as more and more projects are implemented, we think it would be very important to, to document the benefits that are generated by these projects. How many jobs were actually created? Uh, for example, uh, what local economic benefits can be measured um, on the ground? That would be very helpful information to have even more than those few case studies that we looked at in this report. And on, on top of that, we think it would be great for the Office of Surface Mining to look into um, how they can get regular public reports out on the, the progress of the AMLA program and the local economic benefits that have been seen. Um, I realize there's a, 
uh, sensitivity among state agencies. You know, people don't like having having uh, unfunded mandates, and I certainly understand that. Uh, but maybe as OSM looks to changes in the program in the future, and as Congress looks at their options, this type of reporting could be made part of whatever package is passed. And then the, the last conclusion gets back to the different multipliers for the different types of projects. Some types of projects really do appear to have greater local economic benefits, and that should at least be considered when state agencies are making decisions about what types of, of projects to fund. So with that, here's contact information for Dale and Joey and myself, and feel free to contact us with questions that we we have a reasonable amount of time right now to take some questions. All right. Thanks, Evan, Dale, and Joey. We appreciate you. And thanks, Marissa, for the introduction. Hey, again, I'm Adam Wells with Appalachian Voices. I'll be um, moderating our, our Q&A here and, and going to do a little bit of a tangent here for folks that have been following the Reclaiming Appalachian Coalition's work for a while. Uh, we put out a report last year that was authored by uh, Aaron Savage from Appalachian Voices on um, post-law or post-1977 SMACRA permitted uh, mines and the bonding crisis that many of those mines are facing. I'm um, we'll put in the chat the report that we put out on that. There's a congressional hearing tomorrow on uh, an act that has just been re released. The Renew Act is what it's called um, that would address, um, provide money for those uh, bond forfeited projects. I'll put the link where you can watch that uh, congressional hearing tomorrow. So uh, for folks that have been tracking that issue, definitely check it out. Um, Back to our regularly scheduled program here. <laughs> um, so we had a couple of questions already come in the, the chat and in the Q&A. So just to revisit those. Um, Joey, someone asked for the slides. I told them to email you. Hope that's OK. Uh, there's Joey's uh, email address there. Um, and in the chat role, I also put a, a link to um, the reports main page that has um, this report um, live and ready to read up at the top and then our, our whole and growing library of um, reports uh, that the coalition has put out over the years. Um, this webinar is being recorded, as it told you when you joined. Uh, we put all the, the recorded webinars on the website and put the link to the um, webinar page there as well. So check those out. Um, another Q question came in through the Q&A that I attempted to answer. Um, this one came from Antonia. Thanks, Antonia, for the question which was what is the demand for AMLER funds versus the supply of funds? In other words, what is the acceptance rate proposal in each of the six states? Um, and the, the answer is it's hard and it depends. And we, I don't think that we've actually looked at that for uh, this particular analysis. And it, it's challenging because not all states are willing or able to release information about applications that they receive. Um, sometimes it's hard to get information about things that they're funded. We do have the raw data for Virginia um, that we can look at and get a, a number of, of applications and the, the dollar amount that those requests represented versus the $10 million in Virginia that was awarded. Um, yeah, and Adam, um, I have seen in West, in West Virginia, we know it's way oversubscribed. Um, we got a, a spreadsheet this last year of all of the applications that went in. Um, and I want to say that the total was, it was over $200 million in proposals that were received, uh, you know, for $25 million in, in total funding. So way oversubscribed. The demand is, is, is high for, for these grants. Yep. Um, Marissa, anything you want to add um, for your response on that? I, I tried to capture a lot of it here. And I think that is one thing that Joey, Dale and Evan did a good job at is really looking at four completely different program implementations. You know, there was no one state that did it the same way as the other. So I think that that makes answering um, the question that was posed uh, really kind of difficult because for example, in Ohio, we have not had a competitive grant round. They have simply had that kind of 
really close staff led process for the past four years. So there really would be no way to, there were no grants that were disapproved because there were no outside grants awarded, in, you know, at all. So I think that looking across the, the four states, you're going to have four different ways of how the program has been implemented. Um, I think across the region, as these projects start showing more success, you know, I think that was one of my key takeaways is even five years in is not enough time to measure the success of these projects because of how long they take to be developed and to really show their economic um, impacts as these projects only grow in their success and in their notoriety, I think that communities will become more aware of them and the demand for this, this type of funding will only grow. I think this is really unique in the sense of it's a lot more flexible than traditional abandoned mine land funding. And it's a lot different than traditional economic development funding. It's really that hybrid in the middle of these two programs. Um, and it's just taken communities as well as agencies a couple years to figure out the best way to kind of walk that tightrope in between these two um, complementary, but sometimes different uh, funding program priorities. Yeah, thanks for that, Marissa and Joey. Um, here's another question from Kate. Um, to what extent are Ambler funds spent with an eye to potential future economic uses for these sites? Example, solar, wind development, agriculture, what are the barriers to that kind of reuse? Um, I can start with that one and Joey and Marissa jump in. Um, there are there's when you're applying to Ambler grants, there's um, you can kind of pick one or one of two different types of impacts. One is immediate, so like there's a specific project, you know, a brick and mortar project you want to build an, a manufacturing facility. Um, that's one type, and then the other is more like a building a industrial park that will eventually attract economic investment. Um, so you can choose either one of those tracks, and as um, the downstream stream team, the downstream team talked about, um, there's multiple projects in both of those categories that have come up. Um, barriers that is the, you know, the age old problem of build it and they will come, especially in, in coal and Bacti communities. We've seen a lot of, you know, bad examples of, of where that has gone poorly. So that, that's a trap of the, um, you know, future economic impact hope. Anybody else want to jump on that one? I think that was really well said, Adam. I'll just add that, um, you know, in some states, uh, the the site where the activities, the grant activities are happening, doesn't even have to be, um, you know, an abandoned mine land. It just ha has to happen within a community that's impacted by the decline of coal or um, um, is impacted by a, a abandoned mine lands because of the adjacency to those types of features. Um, so in some cases, it's actually, these grants are actually going to, you know, development on non-mine sites, um, but within communities. So just be aware of that. Thing, those are good. One thing I was thinking of, I observed, uh, especially for one project in Ohio, and I suspect it happens more, is if we're looking at the potential long-term impacts, um, we've seen that there are times where an AMLER grant will be combined with a power grant, so the, the or, or private investment, because the private investors see the value of that and want to take it to another level. Our analysis didn't include anything except AMLER grants, but um, both examples of successful projects and projects that could be successful if they had been given permission by the states to, to run where there was private investment and, and long, high long-term impacts associated with those. Um, so the, the question 
posed by the listener is, is excellent because that should be included in thinking about how to leverage those dollars best. Thanks, Dale. All right, well, not seeing any other questions um, in the chat or the Q&A thing. Um, so we'll end here with some gratitude. I uh, wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, thanks for spending your hour with us. Would encourage you to, to reach out and ask more questions and follow up. A lot of really awesome partnerships and ideas have come from people following up on these reports. Um, so we're always excited to hear from you if you wanna talk more about it. Um, thanks, big thanks to our funders. Again, the Just Transition Fund and the New York Community Trust. We appreciate your ongoing and continued support for this important work. Um, thanks to our agency partners in all the states and at the federal level. I'm glad some of y'all could be with us. Um, and thanks, big thanks to the downstream team for your excellent work on this. I think that's all the thanks. Did I miss any, anyone? Okay. Well, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Be in touch. Yep. Thank you.